Welcome to the Parkway Church. My name is Jared Lawson. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 26, that passage Dave just read. And while you open there, it takes people a while, so I'll tell a story. This is to gain your attention, you know, to, to get ready to receive God's word. So, uh, years ago, some of you know, uh, I, I spent some time in Australia uh, with a young adults missions organization called YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Do not Google it and do not think less of me when you do eventually Google it. Uh, it's where I met my wife. Uh, and so kind of how it works is there's a missions base with several different schools throughout it. So there's a, a, a discipleship training school, a school of biblical studies. That's what I did. Uh, there's a surfer school, of course, because it's Australia. Uh, and so every morning we'd have what we called Monday morning worship, this big gathering of all the schools where we'd come together, uh, we'd, lead, you know, we'd have worship, someone would kind of give a quick little sermonette, and then we'd have uh, morning tea, which is a great thing the Aussies and the Kiwis do. Right? America needs to step their 10 a.m. game up. Morning tea, you'd have coffee, you know, cakes, stuff like that that I love. Uh, and sometimes it was really great. Most of the time it was really great. Other times it was not so great. So I'll tell you about a time it wasn't so great. Uh, there was a, a buddy of mine, but he's, but he's a bit of a stretch, a guy I knew, a workplace associate uh, in uh, our, our base. He was, he was a leader of a different school. And we had uh, served together in different areas, and he uh, had left, gone on vacation, went to Bali, as you do. You're like in Australia. Australia's like, boo, you know, I'm tired of getting beat, beaten up by kangaroos. Let's go to Bali. So he went there for a couple months to surf, and he came back, and I saw him. His name's Vlad, or we'll call him Vlad, so you don't know his name is uh, Vladimir. Uh, so Vlad came back, and I thought, great. I'll go say hi to Vlad. It's been a couple months. Uh, Vlad is, is Swiss. But his uh, English is flawless, better than mine. Uh, I thought he was American until someone corrected me. And so I go over to Vlad and I say, hey, man, how was, uh, how was Bali? And he says, oh, mate, Jazza, good to see you. And, you know, they call me Jazza over there. Uh, he, he has this very thick Australian accent. And I think this is strange. Vlad doesn't have an Australian accent. So I think he's joking with me. You know, Tim is always doing accents. You know, I, I didn't know Tim yet then, but I just figured it was one of those situations. So I back to him say, Oh, I missed you, mate. It's so good to see you. You know, I just started doing it back to him. He gives me a strange look, and then he walks away, and I thought, huh, interesting encounter. Uh, later, after, you know, our, our, our gathering was done, we had a, a leadership, you know, meeting, and I sat next to Vlad. You know, it's good. He's back. I'm excited. I'm sitting next to him, and the leader of our whole base says, Vlad's back, everyone. Vlad, go ahead and tell us about Bali. And he said it was heaps great. The surf was, you know, frothing, all the things that Aussies say. Uh, and I realized in that moment, Vlad was not playing a joke with me. He had adopted an Australian accent, and I had accidentally mocked him to his face. So he thinks, there's Jared. You know, let me try out this new Australian accent on him, and I just made fun of him immediately. Uh, and so that was a time where there was a gathering that was not so great. I felt bad. I never spoke to him again. So, Vlad, if you're watching this... Uh, you know, I apologize. Uh, so uh, today, when we look at 1 Corinthians 11, Paul similarly is going to talk about the gathering of the church, their Sunday morning, if you will. This, what we're doing right now, when the Corinthians gather, and uh, for very different reasons than me and Vlad, he's going to say, this gathering is for the worse. It's not for the better when you come together, when you gather, it's for the worse. So we're going to look at the gathering of the Corinthians, but we're going to look th primarily at three things, divisions in the gathering, divisions in the gathering, the abuse of the gathering, and lastly, the communion of the gathering. Divisions in the gathering, the abuse of the gathering, and communion in the gathering. So let me pray, and then we will jump right into this. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians. We thank you for this church that seems to have every problem a church could possibly have. Uh, but I pray that by your spirit, our passage today would uh, search our own hearts and would remove uh, anything that is not glorious, anything that is not of you, and that we might be changed by looking at uh, Paul's wisdom to the Corinthians here, that we might uh, see your son as exalted. We might not partake in divisions. We just pray that you do a powerful work through your word this morning. We pray in your son's holy name. Amen. Okay, let's look at verse 17. Paul's going to start it off on a real happy note. You know, to gear up when Paul's like, look, I'm mad. That's the first sentence. Verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. I always think that's funny, as if he's just been telling them how great they've been doing thus far. 
He's like been yelling at the whole time, and then he's like, and now what I'm about to say, I'm not going to say anything good. And you're like, wait a minute, haven't you been? So anyway, following instructions, I do not commend you. He's rebuking them, right? This whole passage is going to be a big rebuke. Why? Rest of the verse, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. When you gather, when you do this, it's not good. It's not even neutral. It's for the worse. Literally, it'd be better if you didn't gather. It does more harm than good. But in order to understand really what this rebuke is going to be, we need to kind of rethink uh, what, 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 what is the gathering meant to be? What are we doing right now? What do we do in worship when we come in here and, and have coffee and, and meet together with believers and hear from God's word and take communion? What is this meant to be? Because I think we in the Bible Belt maybe have a, a, a low view culturally of Sunday morning. Uh, I was listening to a pastor uh, who's actually a pastor in Allen, great guy. They planted a church in Allen a couple years ago from California. The Californians were like, Texas isn't Christian enough. Let's plant a church there. Uh, and so he, he said, uh, he said uh, the difference, he was, he was reflecting on what's the biggest difference between the gathering, Sunday mornings in California versus here. He's been, there about, been here about five years. And he said, in California, Christianity is not normal. Right? It's not a good thing if you're a Christian. They'll spit in your coffee if they find out you're a Christian. And so when you gather, there's this sense of celebration. There's this natural sense of relief. There's this natural sense of excitement of being with believers. And he, he wasn't really rebuking his people, but he just said, I, I don't really, that's not a natural thing here because Christianity is just normal. This is kind of another thing that we do, and it's a, a, a thing that our culture kind of does, right? How many churches are just on Virginia Parkway alone? We, we tend in the Bible Belt to have a lower view. Right, when, we, when we church search, what are we looking for? How, how do I get my preferences met? What's the music style? Is that what I like? What kind of programs are you going to offer me? Is that what I like? Is the sermon funny? Is it relatable? Like, is, am I going to like the teaching? It's primarily focused on am I going to get my needs met? That, that's a pretty low view of what the gathering was meant to be. So let's just do a nice little review of what is the gathering of Christ's church meant to be when God sends his son into the world in the incarnation to push back darkness with the kingdom of light. Jesus doesn't come and just say, you know, submit, right? That's Islam. Islam doesn't care about heart conversion. They just are like, bow the knee to the flag, right? Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to make a new kind of people. The people of my kingdom are going to be a new kind of people. And we see that in, in, in sermons like the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be a transformed People. These are going to be a people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These people are going to be pure in heart. They're going to be the meek. When persecuted, they're not going to hit back against their persecutors. What are they going to do? They're going to rejoice. They're going to pray for those who persecute them. When they're sinned against, how do they react? They forgive. Seventy times seven. How do they treat their enemies? They love their enemies. A new kind of people. We see uh, in the upper room, John 13 to, to 17, we get this long chapter after chapter of Jesus preparing his disciples. I'm going to go to the cross and then ascend to the Father. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the Spirit. And you, by God's power, are going to advance the kingdom, preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. He's preparing them to be this type of community, this community of the kingdom. And what does he say? How are we to relate one another? First thing we see Wash one another's feet. Love one another. We get verses like this in John 13. By this, all people will know you are my disciples. What would you expect him to say? By this, what I'm about to say, everyone's going to know you're a Jesus follower. What would you expect him to say? By your passion, right? by your zealous you know, living for him, you would lay down your life for him. What does he say? If you have love for one another. This community that loves one another, that washes one another's feet. That's the nature of this community. And then we see in the book of Acts that begin to be lived out. Acts 2, we get this incredible summary. And they, the, the church in Acts, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came over every soul. And, and signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and, uh, and belongings and distributing all the proceeds to all who had need and day by day attending temple together and breaking bread in their homes and they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. What do we see? A people of prayer, 
of people who hear the teachings of the word, of people who fellowship together, who meet one another's needs, and whose witness is powerful. Day by day by day, more and more are being added to their number. That is the community of the kingdom. That's the community Jesus came and established. And the gathering is meant to be right at the center of this. This is the place where we come before our God. Right? We're, we're sinners who have been redeemed by his son. We gather not as uh, Israel gathered before Mount Sinai, paralyzed with fear. We gather as people when the veil has been torn. We can enter into his joyous presence. We're not just his people, we're his children. Right? The true son of God by nature has made us sons and daughters of God by grace. We gather for the spirit to search our hearts, to remove sin. We gather in joy knowing that we were once dead, but we've been made alive. We gather and we love one another, bear one another's burdens. Hebrews 10, stirring up one another to love and good works. Right? How, how do we relate to one another when we come in for the gathering? Uh, serving one another, edifying one another, encouraging one another. That's what the gathering is meant to be. Now, we're not going to dive too far into this, otherwise we'll never get back to 1 Corinthians. But is that what characterizes the Parkway Church on Sunday mornings in McKinney, Texas? Is that our mindset when we walk through these doors? Because Paul is going to say it is possible to gather and have nothing of the reality of what Jesus came to establish take place. It is possible to gather for the worse. It is possible for your gathering to do more harm than good. So what is it, Paul, that you're so upset about? What is it that's causing such harm in this Corinthian gathering? The first thing we see, there's division. There's division of the gathering. Verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are division divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So the first thing we see is that when we come together, there's division. We've already seen uh, in chapter one, right out of the gate, there was uh, divisions on like everyone had their favorite apostle. You know, it's kind of like you guys, like the ones who love Jeff really like, you know, make it known. The ones who love Tim really make it known. They leave after Tim's done with worship. We get it. Uh, They have their, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, I follow Apollos. Uh, But this seems to be different. It's not really a, a theological division. We'll know as we keep reading, it's a social division. What's happening is the Corinthians are taking their status from society. They're taking their social group. They're bringing it into the church and it's tearing the church apart. There's social divisions tearing the church apart. So before we dive into what uh, division itself, let's, let's deal with verse 19 because this is uh, the trickiest part of the passage. Gordon Fee, who's a New Testament scholar, says uh, this is one of the great puzzles of 1 Corinthians, which I laugh at uh, because every commentary I've read on every sermon I preach in 1 Corinthians, someone says something like this. This is the hardest part to understand in 1 Corinthians. I'm like, okay, I guess this whole letter is just a giant mystery. But verse 19 uh, is, is a little confusing. Uh, we'll read it again. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you, uh, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. A little confusing. Why is that confusing? Uh, Paul is rebuking them for their divisions And this verse makes it seem like he's saying something positive about their division. So a lot of people are confused by this. Why would he rebuke them and then stop to say, you know, don't do divisions, but divisions are necessary. Uh, And so there's kind of two ideas happening uh, of what Paul might be doing. The first is to just take it at face value. Paul is making some sort of seemingly random comment about the end of days. So Jesus talks about at the end of days, uh, the sheep and the goats will come before the judgment seat. I'll separate the sheep, bring them into eternal life. I'll separate the goats to eternal death. Or the wheat and the tares, right, they grow up together. And that the, in the last days, I'll, I'll gather the wheat, uh, the wheat, I'll bring it in to make bread with. I don't know, he doesn't keep talking. Uh, and I'll gather the tares, uh, and those will go in the fire, right? So, so Jesus talks about this kind of end times, uh, the end of days, standing before the judgment seat, this separation. And so some think, though it's, it's the minority view, some think that's what Paul's saying. Divisions are bad, but, you know, they're inevitable, and those who are genuine will last. Uh, the, most scholars think, uh, don't actually think that. They think Paul is actually saying something a little sarcastic here. The Corinthians are either uh, misquoting, they've got that Jesus parable, and they're misquoting it. So these kind of high and mighty, you know, haves are saying to the have-nots, 
you know, Jesus does say there's going to be sheep, there's going to be goats. So these divisions are good, right? They're either misquoting Jesus or Paul is just very sarcastically saying, you know, I hear there's divisions, it's not good. But I guess, you know, so that you awesome righteous ones can stand out, there need to be divisions among you. He's kind of using sarcasm to show you're being a prideful fool and you're actually tearing the church apart. Right, these divisions aren't a good thing, they're a bad thing. So either of you take, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, Paul is rebuking them for their self-righteousness. How they're actually tearing the church apart by these divisions. The great irony is when they're coming together, they're not really coming together. There's division among them. So uh, we don't, we reading this, we're, we're going to encounter this a lot, uh, we don't have the type of divisions the Corinthians have. Uh, where there's like high and mighty, you know, rich, high social status people looking down on others. I don't know. Maybe some of you prosper Frisco folk look down on us in your heart. But I don't know about it. But what matters is what's, what's harming the church isn't the exact type of division that the Corinthians have. It's just division itself. So let's do some self-examination. King David in the psalm says, Lord, search my heart, know my thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in me. So it's a good thing to search our hearts. What are the divisions that either exist or have the potential to exist among us? What are the social elements of our, of our you know, identity that we bring into the church that actually has the potential to divide God's church? Mask, no mask? Vaccine, no vaccine? Okay, I can feel the temperature. Did it just get hotter in here? Okay. How are you going to school your kids? Public school? Private school, maybe we do have the wealthy among us, right? Private school or homeschool, even within homeschool, what curriculum are you going to use? Maybe it's just, you know, you're, you've got your, your group. You know, you've got your cool social group. It's just kind of like mean girls. You're like, we've got a high bar of popularity. And I know we're getting a lot more Romanians, but isn't that where Dracula is from? I, I think I'm going to keep my distance, <laughs> right? Maybe you've just got some, some social, uh, social pride going on, right? And... and Notice, what, what is typically our attitude? It's not, you know, people have differences of opinion. I've read, you know, I've done my research. What, what is typically the idea? I, I don't wear a mask. Why? Because I'm not a puppet who's drunk in the liberal government's lies. Or I do wear a mask. Why? Because I have a heart uh, and I love people. Or I do homeschool my kids. Why? Because I'm a good parent. I'm not wicked. I don't understand that question. <laughs> right? What's, that, what's, that, what's the attitude typically? Notice... Super important. I'm not talking about your positions on something. Everybody has a position on everything. I'll give you my, a couple of my positions. Uh, position number one, spicy food or spiciness makes the experience of eating food worse. <laughs> I would like to enjoy this meal, but before I do, can you add a whole bunch of pain on top of it? <laughs> that would be nice, right? That's a position. You might disagree. I don't know how to not believe that as I'm eating and just suffering through this meal, right? I'll give you another one that I don't know how to not believe. Grasshoppers is going to really, uh, all the youth kids are going to torture me for this. Uh, the grasshoppers, worst insect, most terrifying, most just evil. Have you seen a bug's life? Uh, I rest my case, okay? <laughs> They've got like knives on their legs. They always seem to fly at your mouth. I don't understand. Uh, give me like 100 hornets before grasshoppers, right? We all have positions. I'm not talking about your actual positions, do you look down on others who might hold a different position? Who might dare disagree with you? Do you view them as someone who's poisoning the world? Do you view them as someone who's going to ruin your life? Someone as evil? Do you dehumanize them? They're not someone, they're not another human like you who's actually wrestling with a complex issue and maybe has come to a different conclusion. They're just an idiot. They've just clearly been brainwashed. They're just evil. Do you dehumanize them? Politics, do politics divide us? Again, I'm not talking about who you voted for. I'm talking about your identity. When you walk into these doors, is the badge that you wear that you're not a leftist idiot? Is your small talk in the lobby, in this room, about how this political party or that political party is ruining the world? How do you view others? We live in the age of tribalism within the church and outside of the church. I'm in this camp, I'm not in that camp, that camp's evil. Nuance, patience, charitable speech, no time for that. No time for that 
in our day, we're all ready to cancel. That's not just a left thing, seeing conservatives cancel just as many. Whether you lean left or lean right, you're just as poised to cause division, maybe just as guilty as causing division. So, let me give a massive clarifier so I don't get shanked on the way to my car. Uh, I know a lot of you are armed, most of you are armed. Uh, <laughs> I am not in any way, okay, everyone, everyone put down your phones, focus, because this will prevent me from having a lot of, you know, conversations after. I am not in any way talking about not standing for truth. Those who would compromise truth for the sake of unity, one, aren't getting real unity, they're getting fake unity, and two, do more the, to divide the church than anything else. I'm talking about your heart as you stand for truth, as you hold truth as you, you would die for truth, are you humble? Are you gracious? Are you charitable? Do you remember who you are? That you're just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not saying we don't talk about social issues. I'm just saying when we do, don't just spread your anxiety like a fungus. When you talk about our society collapsing around us, Remember who your God is, the sovereign king of the universe. And remember that actually none of this is catching him by surprise. You know who complains about their social circumstances a lot? Uh, every author of like every psalm written, basically. Right? My enemies are all around me. I'm praying and you're not showing up. Incline your ear to me. I'm, I'm, my tears have become my food. But how do they end? How do most of them end? Psalm 88 doesn't really end like this. How do most of them end? but you are the shield that is around me. You are my salvation. You are my defender. You are the lifter of my head. Is that where we end when we have anxiety? Look, I, I, I understand our world is insane. I, have, I, I get the news, as my grandmother would say. We get the news program on our TV. Uh, I'm aware every time I get a phone update, it's something I'm like, man, Going to have to devote nine days to studying that issue and figuring out what to do. Right? I'm aware that our uh, world's gone a little crazy, but if our church, if our gathering is marked by fear, is marked by anxiety, is marked by frustration, is marked by cynicism, is marked by hopelessness, we have fundamentally forgotten the God we came to worship. We have fundamentally forgotten the God we actually came to worship. Here, John 16, Jesus again, preparing his disciples of him going, telling all these terrifying things. Uh, a servant's not greater than his master. They're going to drag you out of the synagogue, basically telling them, look, get ready, it's going to get real rough. They all die really bad, except John. John 16, 33, here's his, uh, one of his final words. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. I have said these things to you. I've prepared you for this. Why? Not so that you sharpen your sword, that you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. It's a promise from God himself. You will have tribulation. What's the next line? But take heart. I have overcome the world. We're anxious. We're frustrated. Join the club. But take those anxieties. Take, them, take those frustrations and lay them at the feet of the king of the universe and let him fill you with joy. Let him fill you with joy. How do we prevent division? Everybody doing okay? Okay. I get a lot of, I'm like, okay, put this back in my holster. Uh, how do we prevent division? Uh, let me give an example. I know we pick on these people a lot. I don't know a lot about CrossFit, but... Uh, I, I know that when a CrossFitter is in your midst, we're in for, you know, a rough time. Uh, in, we should all be healthy. Everybody knows that, right? Health is a good thing. But in the health community, CrossFit people are the worst, right? You go to them and you're like, hey, I eat salads for lunch and I jog, you know, three times a week. And they're like, nobody cares. Did you do burpees for lunch? Right? <laughs> do you follow a level three trainer, whatever that is? I, that's a thing. That's a real thing. CrossFit is like the Scientology of exercise, uh, right? So here, here, here's how we prevent division. Don't be a CrossFit Christian. The gospel is what unites us, not the gospel plus your passion project. When you make Christian unity dependent upon the gospel plus your political party, 
or the gospel plus whatever your tribe is, you actually divide the very thing the gospel's meant to mend. You actually point away from the gospel, not to it. Don't be a CrossFit Christian. Why is uh, disunity, why is division so dangerous? It overturns the very nature of the church that Jesus came to establish. It harms your soul. It takes your eyes off of the gospel. It takes your eyes off of your Savior. puts them back on your own selfishness, on your own pride. If only someone thought like me, we'd all be fine. The world's problems is they're not as smart as me, right? Division harms those around you. It takes their eyes off of the hope that they have in the gospel and sets them back on anxiety. It harms your witness. How, how are you going to be a witness of the hope of the gospel if you are just as anxious as the rest of the world? How are you going to be a witness of the peace of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior if you're just as frustrated, if you're just as furious as the rest of the world? Division harms our witness. Paul says in Philippians 4, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that. It's not just peace generically. A peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul writing this from prison, by the way. Okay, if you're worried about going to prison. Uh, right, still supposed to have peace. He's writing it with an emperor reigning who is dipping Christians in wax and lighting them on fire to light his dinner parties. We can debate this. I would say that's slightly, uh, uh, slightly more governmental overreach than what we're experiencing we can debate that later, though. Uh, but apparently, Paul says in that context, we're supposed to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Jesus, Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor, or all who, are la- who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Realize who he's made us to be, the community he died to create, what this gathering is meant to be. We're meant to be a community of peace, of hope, of rest, and a people who are filled with the joy of their God. That's who we're meant to be. Not divided. That's the first thing. Divisions. Why, why, why when you meet together is it not good? There's divisions among you. What's the second thing? There's one more. It's, it's much worse. Uh, we actually see it's a result of the first thing. The divisions of the community lead to something far worse. They lead to the abuse of the gathering. So the divisions of the gathering lead to the abuse of the gathering, particularly the abuse of the Lord's Supper. So let's read verse 20. Through 22, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating it, each one, uh, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you for this? No, I will not. So, uh, what's happening here? It, it, what's the Corinthian situation? Uh, the, the Corinthians are gathering together apparently for an actual meal, not just for, you know. Meals back then weren't just what we give you, okay? So they had actual, an actual meal, actual wine. Uh, again, think about Jesus establishing the Lord's Supper uh, in the upper room. Him and the disciples are sharing an actual meal. And the haves, right, as opposed to the have-nots, the rich in the society are going ahead and they're eating all the food and drinking all the wine. Apparently there's crazy excess because they're getting drunk, and the poor, the have-nots, are are going hungry, and this is just totally baffling, Paul. Verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat or drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? You see, the meal of the gathering is meant to be different. It is different than any other meal that we would have. Paul's saying, you know, if you want to eat with your little private club, go to your house and do it, but get that out of God's church. Get those divisions out of God's church. In fact, he says the only explanation for being so divisive is that you despise the church of God and want to humiliate those who have nothing. You despise God and hate your brother. That's really the only explanation for causing these sort of divisions. Again, think back to the upper room. Think about Jesus and, and what is he establishing in the Lord's Supper. This, meant, this is meant to be a symbol and a celebration of this new community. And here in Corinth, the very thing that's meant to display and celebrate this unity is being used, is being abused, rather, to show their selfishness, to show their pride, and to show that they actually hate their brother. They're not, their witness isn't everyone knows they're Christ followers because of their love for one another. It's the exact opposite. The exact opposite. You see, their divisions have actually led to hatred. They've actually led to abuse. Sin is never, never, never uh, passive. 
Passivity is a sin, but sin isn't passive. It doesn't just sit there. It's never static. Okay, so uh, we have two kids. Uh, if you hear a kid crying, that's my second one. Uh, our, our first one is the, is the one that uh, Zach and Jeff always call fat. He's going to have massive, you know, insecurities later in life, like when he's 18, and as every 18-year-old does, listen to 18-year-old sermons. Uh, anyway, not him, our second one, our beautiful little baby girl, uh, Joe. She is, she never sits still. I mean, it's unreal. Even as she sleeps, constantly squirming. If you're bored during a sermon, check out this, you know, section and you'll see me trying to hold her as she's like climbing around my neck, right? Never sit still, right? The greatest lie sin will ever tell you is that I'm here, but I'm okay. I'm controlled. I'm not going to mess with you. I'm over here. You don't need to remove me, right? I'm just good in this corner. I'm not going to mess up anything. Just let me hang out here. Everything will be okay. We view sin when we do that, when we listen to that lie. We view sin kind of like going to the zoo, you're like, there's big dangerous animals, but, you know, there's walls and a moat. And yes, Jabari and Harambe escape every now and then. But generally, sin is contained, right? Everything's good, right? I'm safe. But let me give you a better picture. There is a place in McKinney. I don't want to say its name. I usually make that joke and say the actual name. But I don't want to discourage you. Well, I probably should discourage you from going there. Anyway, it's a place in McKinney that has trails and animals. Some of you may have been there. And so we went there as, you know, people trying to entertain a toddler and a 10-month-old and thought animals will be fun to look at for them. Uh, and we go there, and all the outside cages are empty. And we're like, this is a ripoff. And they're like, nope, look, the deer is there in the cage. And I was like, I see those in the wild. And so I go up, and I ask them, where are all your animals? And they said, oh, it's this back room. So it's this back closed-off room. There's like one entrance and one exit. And I go in there, and there's some lemurs, you know, swinging each other by their tails. Real fun. There's a tortoise in a giant glass box that's just doing circles, clearly miserable. I, like, you know, I squatted down next to the glass, and he walked over and said, kill me. And I was like, oh, man, this poor, <laughs> poor tortoise. And then the worst part, there was this hallway of, like, the ten most poisonous snakes. They're like, we caught all Texas' worst snakes and put them here to, for you to look at. But it's not like in this open room. It's like a wall the walkway, and then all the snakes. So you're like trapped in and you have to go and turn around. It gets better. There's a line on the ground that you're not supposed to cross. There's a sign above each snake cage that says, please don't tap on the glass. What will you do if it breaks? And then I inspect the glass. And, uh, you know, it was not like I wanted it to be. It was not bulletproof. It was basically a paper towel. I mean, it was a plastic. It was the biggest joke. And so my wife, being cautious... Never uh, doesn't cross the line, but does pick up our one-year-old and hold him in front of the front of the snake cage, and the snake like pecks on it, and I see it do like one of these things, it's like let's get out of here, okay? Those snakes are in this room with. I mean, th- th- that is just like a joke to them, right? They can come through that whenever they want to. That's a better picture of sin, okay? Even worse, that's a better picture of sin. There's no separation. The second that thing wants to get you, it will. It'll bust through that plastic. And it'll, you know, take you down. Okay, that is what sin is. How does God himself describe sin to Cain? As Cain is is, uh, furious with his brother Abel, God comes to him and says what? Sin is crouching at your door. Not standing, not saying hello, crouching, ready to pounce. Its desire, its longing is for you. It's foaming at the mouth, wanting to get after you. And you must rule over it. You must kill it. You must master it. That's the picture. Sin longs to get you. Kill it or it will kill you. That's what sin is. Sin's greatest lie is just going to say, I'm here. I'm just going to hang out. Don't you worry. Now, here we see in Corinth, division hasn't just sat there. It's not just, you know, we've got our clubs, but we all kind of get along. Division, the sin of division has led to something far worse. Hasn't sat there. It's led to hatred. It's led to abuse. Now, where does looking down on others, something that may seem somewhat innocent, where does that lead? It actually eventually will lead to you saying, you know what? They are beneath me. I am better than them. I am actually more enlightened than them. We may not say that out loud. That is what we believe. Uh, There's a podcast that I listen to every now and then uh, called The Rest is History. 
It's a real popular one. Uh, uh, not really. It's two historians, Dominic Sandbrook and Tom Holland, not to be confused with Spider-Man, but an actual historian. And they just take different themes and they talk about it. And one of their first episodes was uh, Civil War. Not our Civil War, just all Civil Wars. Uh, and so they were talking about what are the factors that most civil wars, if not all, have in common when you just get neighbors that will just attack each other and just start killing each other. I mean, something that's happened time and time and time again. You know what they said? If you can get, your if you can get someone, a people, to believe that their neighbor across the street are no longer human, they're just evil, they only have bad intentions, they're here to destroy your way of life, them being alive is just bad for you. Them acting is just bad for you. It eventually becomes a moral good to remove them. It eventually becomes a moral good to kill them. And I thought, man, that sounds like a lot of everything I see on Twitter, right? That's uh, terrifying, right? That's, uh, it's, it's happened time and time and time again. Division always leads to something worse. It never just stops there. Looking down on others never just stops there. It eventually does say, it lead to, you are beneath me. To quote the great New Testament scholar uh, Yoda, uh, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to, there you go, suffering. Preston, you let me down. That's where I was really hoping this, my Star Wars fans would let us in. Right? Fear never just stays there. It leads to eventually suffering. Or to quote the actual New Testament author, James, James 1, 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. And then desire, when it is conceived, get, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. When you look down on others as beneath you, that does lead somewhere evil. And here, primary example of the Corinthians, their divisions have led to actual hatred of their brother. So again... We are not experiencing their exact situation. No one here is getting drunk on the communion wine. That's why they're in such small cups. We knew you'd be tempted. So we decided to uh, head that problem off at the pass. But again, the problem isn't their drunkenness. What's behind the drunkenness? Pride, arrogance, and selfishness. Again, where are we looking down on others as beneath us? Whereas holding the truth, holding to the truth a good thing, actually led you to sinful pride. Let me ask you, when people stray from the truth, as we've seen, you know, it happens all, it's happened two years, uh, all across evangelicalism. When someone strays from the truth, what's your reaction? Is it a broken heart and praying for them to come back to the truth? Or do you scoff? Do you just think, there's another person who's going to vote wrongly and make my life worse? What's your heart reaction when someone strays from the truth? Praying for those who might persecute you? Loving your neighbor? Or is it hatred? Where are we assuming that we're better? Not that our position is better. Our position probably is better. But where are you are assuming you're better for coming to that position? See that difference? That's an important distinction. Not that our position is better. That's fine. The truth is always better than falsehood. But where are we assuming we're better because we've arrived at the truth? Where are we being selfish, focusing on just getting our needs met, using people for our own gain? Where is our focus not on God or loving our neighbor but on Ourself, do you see how backwards that is from what Jesus came to establish? When we do that, we've forgotten who we are. We were created by a gracious God, first and foremost, created by the grace of God. God created us and holds us in being right now. Uh, one of the frustrating things, uh, uh, I went to private school. I feel like that's obvious <laughs> by my general kind of daintiness. I'm like, oh, a bug. Uh, <laughs> and so I actually went back to my uh, private school to work uh, after uh, not going to college, because when you don't go to college, you have to beg your old high school for a job. So I did that for a while. Uh, and one of the most frustrating things is these kids uh, who are, you know, the private school is near South Lake. That tells you a little bit about it. Uh, these kids who have done nothing but be born to rich parents uh, and they're, you know, driving Porsches, and they just are so arrogant. It just drove me insane. Like, you didn't do anything. You were just born, right? Your parents are the ones who did everything. That frustration is pointing to something that is true of all human beings. God created you. Every breath that you breathe, every, every next heartbeat he's giving you, and there's nothing other than his grace uh, of why you were born here rather than a cannibalistic tribe in Papua New Guinea 500 years ago. 
That's all by the grace of God, and even more so for Christians. You're created by God's grace, and you're redeemed by a gracious God. There is nothing good in you or me that wasn't brought about by our redemption. How could we ever look down on anybody else? Jesus says, gives a, gives a parable in Luke 18. I'll read it for you. He, Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves for their own righteousness and treated each other with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like these other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, liberal voters. Wait, no, no, sorry, that's not in there. Uh, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. And I give tithes on all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to the heavens and beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down from his house justified rather than the other. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Never forget who you are. But for the grace of God, you are just as ignorant you are just as lost and you are just as foolish as anyone that you would ever dare look down on. Never forget who you are. Let me say it stronger. You and I are so wicked that nothing less than the death of the Son of God could save us. How could we not be humble all the time? How could we ever drink in self-righteousness? How could we ever look down on anybody else? The redeemed those who have been saved by God's grace and know who they are apart from God's grace. And so what characterizes us or what should characterize us rather than pride and arrogance is gratitude and humility. That's what characterizes the redeemed. So we see divisions has led to something far worse, abuse, hatred, a brother. The Corinthians have forgotten who they are. And so Paul has laid them low, right, rebuked them, and now he's going to teach them what is it if you're tearing this church apart, what is it that unifies us? What is it that does bring us together? What is it at the gathering that is meant to bring us together? And that's when he's going to build them back up with this last point, the communion of the gathering. The communion of the gathering. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this club, uh, cup, you pro, uh, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, firstly, verse 23, we see the source of this communion. For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. Paul saying, Everything I taught you, wasn't just my idea, or just it wasn't what I thought was best. I received it from the Lord. It came from him, and I delivered it to you. What we do here isn't just man's best attempt. It's been established by Jesus and delivered to us. And so the question then is how. How did he establish it? How does he establish this community? And Paul tells us through his broken body and his shed blood. This is my body, which is for you. The only one who was never broken the only one who was never broken gave his body over to be broken so that you and I could be put back together. The only one who was never broken gave over his body to be broken so that by his wounds we might be healed. Through his shed blood, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The one who is life himself gave himself over to death, shed his blood unto death so that you and I could have eternal life to bring us into the new covenant. What is, what is the new covenant? We use that term a lot. What is the new covenant? Jeremiah 31, uh, the prophet Jeremiah pointing towards this great day of salvation that is to come. And Jesus is coming, pointing forward to this new covenant, says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, and my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
No longer shall each teach his neighbor or each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How have we been brought into this new covenant reality through his blood? How did we get from Israel, the old covenant, to the new covenant through his blood? Someone had to pay the penalty for our covenant breaking to bring us into the new covenant. And he didn't just do it, notice, he didn't just do it to change our destination. He didn't just do it so that we could go to heaven. He did it to change our hearts so that we might know God. So when we gather, we don't just worship because God says so. This isn't a giant rule following. I mean, I guess technically it is, but it's not just, that's not the primary reason that we do it. We gather to worship our Father. Notice he's not just a just judge who declares us innocent, or a merciful judge, rather, who declares us innocent. He's our Father. Through Jesus, you've been brought into the ultimate community. The same fellowship the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have been eternally sharing in. You've been brought in. The true Son of God by nature has adopted you, brought, given us adoption by grace. And we worship with our eternal family. How are we to view one another? Uh, several years ago, I was uh, talking with a pastor who was slightly uh, racist. Uh, and what I mean by that is actual racist, not like postmodern racist, uh, like actual racist. Uh, and so we were talking, and his church was dying, and uh, he had a guest preacher uh, uh, who was African-American, who's also had a church that was dying. And I asked him, hey, why don't you all merge? You're, you know, same dom- denomination, similar location. He just said, I don't think we could do that. And I said, why? And he goes, he's an African-American pastor. And I thought, mm, okay, we got a lot, of deal, a lot of stuff to deal with, which we dealt with that later. But the first thing I said to him was, you will be worshiping with them for all of eternity. So you might as well, you know, get some practice now. Okay. When we look at each other, I, you know, and then we had a race, we talk, had to talk about why racism is bad after that. Uh, when we look at each other, we don't just see people who, you know, live in the same general area and believe the same creeds that we do. We see our eternal family. So if you don't like each other, you're going to have to figure that, that part out. So just, you know, go ahead and get some practice now, okay? We, we gather together as those who have been redeemed, who have been bought by his blood, who, who don't just have uh, a law that we follow in common, but have a law that's written on our hearts. We have a new heart. We have new fe- affections for him. We have a father that we look to, that we've been brought in. Do you know why division is so offensive? Because the only one who could ever truly say, I'm better than you, the only one who could ever truly say, I do have all the status in the world, the only one who truly had all the glory, the only one who was ever truly perfect, laid it all down to raise you up. Philippians 2, Paul talking about this. Jesus, uh, as he's referring to, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Our community, our Christian community was formed through the greatest act of humility ever. How could we ever follow that Savior with pride in our hearts? How could we ever follow that Savior and look down on others as lesser? That's not who our Savior is. Lastly, Paul's going to say, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What is uh, the Lord's Supper? What is this communion of the gathering meant to do to our eyes? Lift them. Lift our eyes to him. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember who we are, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, with the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead. He made us alive with Christ. We remember who we are. We remember who our Savior is, that he's the one who gave over his life so that we might live. We remember he's the one that calls the prostitutes, the zealots, the tax collectors. Those guys don't really get along. If you read your history, uh, the, the, the slave and the free, the male and the female, the Jew 
and the Gentile. And he doesn't just say, get along, figure it out. He says, I'll change your heart. I'll tear down the dividing wall of hostility. How? Through his broken body and his shed blood. Paul here is not just giving a moralistic scolding. He's saying there's, there's division that's evil and wicked. You want to solve it? Don't look to yourself. Look to him. Look to him, setting their eyes back on the only one who truly can change a prideful heart. The only one who can ever actually humble the self-righteous. The only one who can ever remove selfishness, replace it with brotherly love. Points back to him. And then those last three words, we remember his death until he comes. We remember the hope that we have. That no, better, no, no matter how bad our society is getting, it is horrible, it is bad, it's getting worse. No matter how bad it gets, we worship with peace and with hope and with joy, knowing our Savior is coming again. And one day there will be no more tears, no more pain. The dwelling place of God will be with man and our Savior will return and make all things new. Let's pray together as we actually prepare to take the Lord's table. Father, we love you. We recognize that we are but uh, human. We are sinners saved by grace. Even though you call us saints, we're simultaneously justified and a sinner. And so uh, we can never, by our own moral uh, abilities, change our own hearts. That's something you have to do. And so we ask that you would send uh, your spirit to banish all division in this church. Uh, even though it's not exactly what the text is talking about, I pray that you would do some sort of miraculous work to, to mend just wider evangelicalism. Uh, not where we would release truth, but even stronger hold to it, that we would die for it, but just be far more humble, far more charitable, especially in how we view uh, ourselves and how we view our brothers and sisters. We pray that, you, pr pray that you would do that in us, Father, that we might walk in joy Lord, everyone that you humble, everyone that you bring low, it's a joyous thing. How can David pray to you to search his heart when he's not even aware of sin in him? Because he knows that the uprooting of sin turns our eyes back to you. We look away from our mud pies and we get invited into the holiday at the sea. We, we have our eyes set back on our ultimate hope and our ultimate joy. We pray that you would do that in us. We pray by your son's name. Amen.